Hi, and thank you for joining me for another lecture. And friends, today I want to discuss a very important topic. And friends, that topic is that it is not, nor has it ever been a mitzvah to go to or to secure yourself a place in heaven or to not go to hell. In other words, friends, it seems that the reason, the whole reason that at least two of the three major world religions are split is basically over beliefs that the other is not going to make it to heaven or might even end up in hell. And this goes both for the Orthodox and Messianic world. And yes, that's pretty much it. A split over heaven and hell. For example, at least regarding Messianic Jews, the only thing we really disagree with is how to either get to heaven or hell i.e. Messianics teaching that it's through Yeshua and Orthodox Jews claiming that it's through the belief in another Messiah as it states in the Yud Gimel Karimuna regarding those who choose not to believe in the coming of the Messiah. In other words, we know that the New Testament never contradicts the Torah regarding reward and blessing in this world. As a matter of fact, many times it just reiterates the blessings mentioned in Torah regarding doing good that are virtually always regarding reward in this world, in, in Olam Hazeh, and not the next. For example, we know that Yeshua never really preached on the notion of hell as it's understood today for not accepting him as the Messiah. And the closest thing he did speak about was a place of gnashing of teeth, which Matthew chapter 8 verse 12 depicts only as a place where the unrighteous are, in a way, distraught from missing out on the rewards of the righteous. Actually, it speaks a lot more about not entering heaven than actually entering hell. Actually, what Yeshua did say regarding the horrors of hell as it's described today was only for those who don't keep the law and choose to live a life of sin, as it states that the Son of Man will send his angels to gather them out of his kingdom and all who cause sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into a fiery furnace. Or when it says that if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off because it's better to enter this world with one hand than to go to hell. And yes, friends, every time it mentions sin, it means what causes sin, i.e. breaking of the law. And these ideas, although not mentioned literally in Torah, are at least, like we said, for breaking Torah commands. In other words, the Torah never speaks about a heaven, and for sure, for sure, it never speaks about a hell. And every blessing or curse that it ever mentions within it was always only meant to be absorbed in Olam Hazeh, in this world, and that's all. And like we said, that Yeshua never taught against the Torah on this. No, friends, the only new idea the New Testament brought to the table was Olam Haba, the next world. And on on this basis did the separation ever begin. Now, don't worry, because actually Judaism or Judaic or rabbinic literature has a lot, a lot more to say regarding heaven and hell and how to get there than the New Testament could ever squeeze into 27 books. Well, friends, what if I told you that virtually everything the New Testament says about hell, which is not much really, all stems from what we call in rabbinic literature as Agadah, i.e. legend and folklore. Now, some may then say that Judaism never taught that if someone doesn't accept Judaism that they're going to hell like Christians or literally Paul taught. And friends, please know that if you have ever heard someone say that statement, that person is not familiar with what is understood as Judaism today. Why? Because it was actually a machloket, a disagreement amongst Hazal that if Gentiles who failed to convert, whether righteous or not, had a place in the world to come. And for some reason, Jews today chose to side by the Rambam's opinion that if they would at least keep seven laws, they do have a share, while if they don't, they would not, and would end up in some sort of hell. And this goes for both Christians and Muslims. So the idea is virtually identical to a Christian ideology, that if you don't embrace their belief system, you are destined to hell, with the exception that modern-day Judaism has lowered the bar to accepting the Noahid laws and living by them because they were given to Moshe Rabbeinu, which is why tradition teaches us that Muslims also won't make it to the next world, although Judaism does not view Islam as idolatrous. So no, the New Testament didn't make anything up in this area, lest a Jew try to point his finger or her finger at a messianic or a Christian for condemning others who don't join them. So friends, if this is ultimately all that separates us, why don't we, on the basis and the foundation of what we can both unite on, Torah, put our differences aside and begin repairing this world through the instructions in Torah. Now, some may say that it is the Messiah that separates us, and this just reiterates my point. 
And friends, this goes both for Orthodox Judaism and Messianic Judaism. And the point is, friends, is that the notion of the Messiah also does not appear in Torah. And it's actually a much later idea than heaven and hell itself. And because of this, you're going to forfeit love and unity through a code that inspires individual moral training, our Torah, and in this you feel justified? Because again, friends, the Torah never, never, never mentions heaven or hell or a Messiah. Now, there's nothing wrong with you believing in any of these things as long as you consider them personal beliefs and not beliefs literally sanctioned by Torah. Because I also believe that the Almighty, to be just, he would have to reward the good and punish evil. And this would have to extend into some other realm because as we know, that many good people die without ever being rewarded in this life and many evil people thrive without ever being punished in this life. But again, the dynamics of heaven or hell and what one needs to do to attain either of the two cannot exist or be derived from outside of Torah. And friends, as you already know, our Torah only tells us that our magnificent creator will only punish us or reward us for either keeping or not keeping his commandments, as Torah mentions. And being that we have at least two commands within the Torah itself telling us that we're forbidden from adding or taking away from what the Torah demands from us, that pretty much ends the argument. And again, I'm a Jew who believes in what people call today as rabbinic or oral law, but I also believe that these laws only deal with the practical execution of mitzvot, and not in any way with the legislation of metaphysical reality, because only Torah Shebiktav, only the written law, can establish this. So friends, I'm here to tell you today that you shouldn't care whether someone tells you you're going to hell or you're going to heaven if your behavior does not contradict what the Torah demands and should be happy yourself to unite with anyone who keeps the commandments in this Torah, the only undisputed words of the Almighty. And friends, through the keeping of these mitzvot, strive to make this world better and about the next world, let it worry about itself. I mean... Don't you think the Torah wanted us to worry more about the next world than this one? It would have mentioned something about it? Anything? Not to mention that the notion of heaven or hell does not appear in the rest of Tanakh either. Not just Torah. And also friends, what if I told you that Christians or Messianic Jews during the days of Paul only had Torah? In other words, there was no New Testament. And at that time, Tanakh as we have it today wasn't even canonized yet. In other words, in Christian terminology, there was no Old Testament either with the exception of Torah. So Paul, assuming that he was part of the rabbinic world as well, only had Agadot, Jewish legends, to build his doctrines of heaven and hell from. And with the only book in the New Testament that gives the notion of an eternal hell being the book of Revelations, a book that till today, no one, not even in the Christian world, really knows who wrote. A book that the Catholic Church just chose to lump together with the Gospels and Paul's writings. Why? I guess because they wanted to. In other words, because of that book, you're supposed to think that every non-Christian is going to burn for eternity. Friends, since when did that book ever outweigh the words in Torah? In other words, from a personal belief, you can believe what you want. But what you can't do is in some way say that God believes it and sanctions it also. If it's not mentioned in Torah, whether you're a Jew or a Christian, mainly because the Torah is crystal clear that the only reason, again friends, the only reason we suffer are for not keeping the commandments within Torah. And that's it, as it states, his hukim and his mishpatim. And the same goes for the Messiah, and this goes both for Christians and Orthodox Jews. In other words, you have Orthodox Jews tossing righteous, Torah-keeping Messianic Jews from the Jewish world only because they happen to believe someone is the Messiah that they, the Orthodox Jews, don't accept? Friends, when did the Torah ever command you to believe in a Messiah in the first place? And if it doesn't, why are you going to condemn someone and separate them from Torah life just because they have adopted a Messiah you reject? Doesn't that sound a bit ridiculous? And no, friends, like I said, I'm no Karaite Jew either, in case some wonder why I don't venerate Agadot. In other words, friends, I believe in the oral law, but like I've said many times in many videos, that Midrashim and Agadot, i.e. anything that talks about Olam Haba or Gehenna, is not part of Torah Shabbat Peh not part of the oral law, mainly because it contains no law. Not to mention that Chazal were only authorized to rule on practical matters and not metaphysical issues. 
Because if not, why don't they just rule that the Messiah should arrive tomorrow or that the exile should end? In other words, friends, only Torah had the authority in that area. And as Torah itself states that the secret things are for the Almighty himself and only the revealed things are for us and our children forever. So what does this teach us? Well, that everything metaphysical, i.e. secretly or spiritually divine outside of the pages of Torah is all fallible and possibly not true. And only what the Almighty has personally revealed in his Torah is for us to accept and to do. Actually, if I was a Christian, I would ask the same question regarding Paul's writings on how can the words of a man who never even met Yeshua set 90% of Christian doctrine, especially in areas that the Gospels are silent on. In other words, friends, regarding a place that, at least from a scriptural perspective, does not objectively exist, in other words, over something that has a greater possibility of not existing than existing, we're going to condemn and separate each other? My friends, where do we get the audacity to do something like that? And again, this goes for both heaven and hell. In other words, my, my dear friends, you can't use principles that were developed later to then judge and redefine an earlier work and its ideas. Because if that's the case, what would ever stop us from adopting a whole new different religion just on the basis that it claimed to be correct? No friends, Torah and the ideas and instructions contained within it is our unchangeable standard and anything that tries to change its message should either be disposed of or properly called commentary and opinion, but not Chas Shalom Torah itself. In other words, friends, everything our biblical heroes did in scripture, they did either for goodness sake or because of a healthy fear or love of the Almighty, or for how ultimately their actions made this world better, but never because of a fear of hell or of a reward of heaven. No, friends, this is a later pagan idea. Because if then, what was the point of the Almighty giving us an ethical law code to begin with? If not so that through a united effort of keeping this law, we can instill a moral change in this world. In other words, friends, notions of heaven and hell as part of a theological doctrine, instead of just a personal belief about the Almighty rewarding the good and punishing the wicked, has hurt us more than it has ever helped us. And it has ultimately made the Torah experience into a narcissistic one of just getting by or just using mitzvot as our own personal vehicle to escape reality and real problems that beg a solution that only Torah keepers can physically deliver. And this is why we have to unite on our common ground. Because in this area, quantity, my friends, is a quality. And the purpose of Torah and ultimately religion is to make this world better to reward the good and punish evil in this world, which comes with the ultimate elation of finding joy and our loving creator through that, and not just worrying about some future world. And this is what it means to be a Jew. So what do I want you to do? Friends, I want you to invite your messianic neighbors and messianics, assuming you keep Jewish law, I want you to invite your orthodox neighbors over to your house for Shabbat and enjoy and rejoice with each other on the basis that you both keep Torah and on that basis that you belong to the people of Israel. Because again, it is only Torah that unites us and thus only Torah that should have the power of separating us. And friends, for more information on everything Jewish, please visit BeJewish.org. Thank you.